Britain is governed by the blob. I don't mean Boris Johnson and his circle of ministers, but these guys over here. The amorphous mass of civil servants, charities and academics who work together to push policies they prefer and hold back policies they dislike. The term comes from a 1958 horror movie where an oozing alien arrives from outer space and starts to absorb everything it sees. The British blob behaves in much the same way. When the Labour Party takes office, it seems to enjoy an environment where anything is possible. When the Conservatives take power, they find themselves constantly held back by civil service obstruction and judicial review. To take an example, when Michael Gove became Education Secretary in 2010, he brought with him his advisor, Dominic Cummings, and a suite of ideas for improving Britain's schools. By 2013, he was publicly complaining about the sheer difficulty of getting anything done. It wasn't that Gove's ideas weren't workable or weren't working. It was that time and time again, whenever he tried to change things, he ran into resistance from what he called the blob. To understand the blob, I spoke to individuals involved in government, including former ministers and the civil servant currently working within a department on condition of anonymity. The civil service prides itself on value and diversity. It welcomes all colours and creeds. It publishes long strategies on how it can boost representation for minority groups. And it runs networks to help people assimilate into the culture of the organisation. It is also in some ways near monoculture. The civil service ideal is a world where people look different but think the same. A 2016 report found that entrants onto the civil service fast stream programme were overwhelmingly not from working class backgrounds. In fact, only 4% of those accepted in that year came from such households. For those keeping score at home, that's less diverse than Oxford University. There's a tendency to monoculture in the establishment because, as you say, they, most of them come from the same backgrounds and it's a very, very narrow background. And then the people who come into that background also tend to adopt almost like chameleons, similar protective colouring, you know. The structure of the civil service is really still a civil service which is based around generality. So in other words, people, jacks of all trades, <coughs> rather than specialist people that are, have got their hands dirty doing projects. It varies, obviously. As I said, there are very good civil servants in the civil service who are as frustrated as many politicians are about the inability at times of the civil service to move and to change the way they, uh, they promote people and they reward people. It's not a bad thing that our civil service is picking up graduates from the best universities. It's a comforting thought that there is at least some merit in our meritocracy. What is a problem is that they have all been marinated in the same educational environment. They picked up the same acquired values. And this problem worsened with Tony Blair's expansion of the higher education sector from 1997 onwards. Education, education and education. One of these values was a staunchly pro-European outlook, one which caused problems when they were asked to implement a referendum result they disagreed with. You wouldn't ever admit that you supported Brexit. I've met maybe three people in the civil service who are in favour of Brexit or who would admit so privately. I certainly would never admit to being in favour of Brexit. It would be professional suicide. I've even seen colleagues humiliated and ostracised for supporting Brexit. The overwhelming majority of people were opposed to it. And I think that comes from the fact that most of the intake in the civil service is Whitehall-based, it's London-based. They've gone to universities and taken courses in European studies. The universities have obviously been very pro-European and they've had an indoctrination into that. It's not representative of the country and a diversity of views. In the context of Brexit, it's undoubtedly the, the case that a large part of the establishment, a large part in particular of the civil service, service, simply did not understand what people are trying to achieve by Brexit, didn't understand where it was coming from. I mean, clash with their vested interests, all those foreign office civil servants who were looking forward to their jobs either in the Commission or in the embassies of, around Europe, uh, to the Treasury civil servants, who did this was a sort of written into their veins almost, um, who found it very, very difficult to understand the, the logic of going the other way. This homogenising effect of university education and similar backgrounds has also led to the rise of a new ideology taken up by the blob. In recent years, the civil service has adopted identity politics into its culture, hiring processes and so-called diversity and inclusion networks. 
Civil servants sent us examples of this ideology in practice, including posters in the Treasury telling officials to avoid using words such as crazy that might be considered offensive to those with mental health problems. Officials have also complained of being bombarded with emails from their bosses about events such as Bi Visibility Day, the Transgender Day of Remembrance, and Trans Awareness Week. One email sent to the entire civil service from the then cabinet secretary, Mark Sedrill, read, As a white senior leader, I try to understand the lived experience of ethnic minority colleagues and citizens, using language straight out of the woke playbook. Other messages show civil servants being told to use gender-neutral language, and one permanent secretary wrote to her staff saying, I want to double down on our work to ensure that everything we do internally and externally is supporting the diversity, collaboration and inclusion agenda. When I first joined the civil service, I had never heard the word intersectionality. Soon I was sent on classes on intersectionality, where I learned all the new diversity and inclusion language that one needs to learn in order to thrive. And from my experience, this is the new religion. And if you disagree with it or question it in any way, you're cancelled. For example, I had a colleague who had a similar experience as I did of reaching a glass ceiling. So he joined the BAME Corporate Identity Network. I've joined the Non-Binary Network. I'm wearing my non-binary lanyard today and my preferred non-binary pronouns are they, their and them. And in my colleague's case, he actually, by his own admission to me, never actually suffered an experience within the civil service of racism in his life. He came from an Asian background, but he actually felt compelled to fabricate imaginary experiences of racism so he could play the victim card. As soon as he did this, he jumped three civil service grades after one interview. And as soon as I declared myself falsely as non-binary, it was like the glass ceiling broke, heavens parted, and I just embraced the intersectionality dogma. So how does the blob operate? In practical terms, the system looks something like this. Ideas originate in academia, paid for by the government. They make their way into the charity sector, funded by left-wing organisations and the state. They receive a generous hearing from the left-leaning parts of the press and the civil service. Then, when the time comes for policy to be made, there is a well-funded and effectively well-coordinated lobby pushing for particular policy outcomes. It's something like a magic trick. It's a big one! Left-wing organisations in the government put money into a pot, the money gets shuffled around between charities, and then, hey presto, you have grassroots activism. So are Sir humphrey civil servants bending ministers to their will? But if the minister wants open government... You don't just give people what they want if it's not good for them. You can see yourself that uh, there are people in government departments who don't want that particular government's views of life. It tends to be people on the left that are more agitated on that, and it tends to be the makeup of how they are. So there are certainly people in there. They leak quite a lot. There have been a lot of leaks recently, particularly in the Home Office. This is very deeply undermining of a government. All governments face it, including Labour governments, but I think recently this government has faced probably quite a lot more of it. And I think this is a bit of an indictment of civil service culture at the moment. The civil service are masters at micromanaging ministers, filtering information and making sure that they don't see certain things. And quite frankly, I just think a lot of ministers aren't actually aware of what we're talking about today. I don't think they see the civil service culture. They're not really a part of it. They're kept very much separate. And I think that they probably need to be doing a bit more, walking around the building and just take a look around the place, maybe have a few more interactions with civil servants. I think they'd be quite surprised. Perhaps one recent example of the blob at work is a row between ministers and civil servants who are refusing to return to their offices. So if the government says back to work, then the civil service should come back to work because they're there to serve the government and through them, the people of the United Kingdom. And I think that's very important. Let's investigate one example of the blob at work. The Scottish Refugee Council is a charity in Scotland which campaigns for the rights of asylum seekers and speaks out against what it views as unjust policies. Last year, its budget came to £4.5 million. Of this, 30% came from EU funds, 18% came from other charitable trusts, 29% came from the Scottish Government, and 6% came from local authorities. In fact, if the organisation had to stand on the money it raised through memberships and donations, its budget would have been £330,000. Doctor, nothing will stop you. 
If you look through the organisation's annual impact reports, you'll find plenty of examples of its work lobbying for political change. In 2019, it stated, we changed the law, claiming its work with MSPs had led Holyrood to give refugees the right to vote. In 2021, they campaigned to bin the Borders Bill, working with charities and faith groups across Scotland and briefing MPs and MSPs on reasons to vote against legislation. This is pure blob. Work to advance progressive causes while impeding conservative ones. Money comes from the British state and from charitable grants, themselves often given by organisations funded in part by the British taxpayer, and is used by the organisation to lobby the state to change. Not everyone agrees the blob exists, or disagrees with the term as an oversimplification. I know the civil service, and the civil service clearly has quite a strong culture. There are, I would say, really good things about that culture, like it's generally, you know, rule abiding, rule following, a high sense of propriety, a strong sense of ethics. But there are also difficult things about that culture as well, like it can be very difficult for outsiders to uh, penetrate. And uh, it is a good thing to shake up the civil service, to bring uh, new thinking, more diversity of thought and background into the civil service. But is that the blob? Does it really help us talking about the blob? I'm not sure. Take a look at the last 12 years of British government. Woke ideas have marched unchecked from the academia to the press through to Parliament. On social issues, the Conservative Party behaves like the Labour Party on a five-year time lag. Whichever party is in government, the blob remains the same. It sounds like a conspiracy theory. Surely you couldn't coordinate an organisation this large. Well, no, you couldn't. You don't have to. Like the monster it takes its name from, the blob has no organising intelligence. You can't point to someone and say they're in charge, or even that they give it direction. Instead, the blob is an outcome rather than an entity. It consists of people with similar views and similar backgrounds being exposed to similar incentives. And when those incentives line up correctly, they all pull in the same direction. And that's a problem. From Michael Gove's attempts to reform education, through to allegations that officials undermined Brexit negotiations, ministers with a mandate for reform find themselves undermined time and time again by the bloc.